Okay, I'm going to make a week. Okay, I'm going to make a week. Okay, I'm going to make a week. Okay, I'm going to make the time is passing, and not just the days, but months and years. Uh, naturally. The third reason is very or is very basic, but it's incredibly important for most of us. It's beautiful. Flying birds are beautiful. They're very popular in animation. Use their elegance to just feed feed elegance to the film. Make the whole film more fluid, more timeless, more natural. Uh, timeless in this context, I mean that birds have always been there, that they will always be there. It's not about yesterday and then today and what we expect tomorrow. No, birds are always there, they will always be there. So it's a moment of timelessness in that, in that context. There are different ways of using more timeless. Are you okay? So here's a very, very traditional example of using a very simple, straightforward symbol which we know internationally throughout all the cultures. Um, the same bird would make, mean something else in a different context. You can't just say, okay, I'm going to make a film, I'm going to show lots of birds and people will feel that time has passed. It doesn't work like that. Symbols are something you have to feel. Um, you can buy books about how to interpret your dreams, where all the symbols are explained. If you dream of a white horse, it means this. If you dream of a dragon, it means that, you know, the classical uh, symbols. It doesn't work like that. And even Carl Jung uh, strongly advised guys like that. You, you have to see the symbols in that context. You have to feel them. It, they have to feel real. And then they become really interesting. Okay, so I made a little list of my thoughts on the, on the power of symbols. Obviously, obviously they have a practical value. And the typical example is the road signs, the signs to indicate um, uh, where you, if you have to turn left and so on. They're purely practical. Um, another example is banknotes. When you use a banknote, when you pay, you pay with an ordinary little piece of paper or something that looks like paper. It's not, it's a symbol. It symbolizes money, it symbolizes value, uh, etc., etc. By the way, when I mean symbols, I mean signs, metaphors, uh, parallels, the, the whole lot. It's like a gener generic uh, term just for the purpose of this conversation. And I also believe that symbols are perceived um, with all our senses, not just our eyes. Obviously, uh, music is symbolic, obviously, smells are symbolic. Obviously, movements are symbolic when you look at a dancer, for instance. So, a practical value. Then, symbols have the capacity to tell you very simply something that's actually very complex, or very mysterious, or very abstract. And a typical example is the flag, let's say the flag of the United States. You see one flag of the United States, just a piece of cotton, cotton it's red, blue, and white colors, and you know you are. Uh, looking at the culture and the politics of the United States. And then the context will, of course, explain why you're looking at the flag. If you look... Um, there was another example I had. <coughs> oh yes, a very nice example, which we overlook often, is a scent, a smell. Some smells represent a whole person for you. One day you will smell a smell and you will will probably cry because it will remember you, it will remind you of someone you loved very much and who died, for instance. It's not the smell itself, it could even be a slightly unpleasant smell, but it symbolizes the person. And actually, I find smells very, very powerful. I always regret that films can't work with smells because they bypass the mind. You <coughs> think it smells, it just immediately connects with, with the, uh, the emotion or the, or the, the, the value, the, the energy of <coughs> then thirdly, I would say, um, so symbols clarify things, they make things very simple for you, things that are very complex and very mysterious, but thirdly, they, in a way they also do the opposite. They can make something which is very familiar and very ordinary <laughs> special again, just like when you were a young child. A uh, typical example is a landscape okay. painting. It can show a landscape that you have seen a thousand times, but when you look at the painting or the photograph or the film, you see it in a new way. And you see it in a new way at that moment while you're watching the landscape. And it's possible that you will see it in a new way from that moment onwards, ever. Portraits are a classical example. So, so to put it in a very, very simple way, I think that function of symbols 
to make the ordinary extraordinary again makes you appreciate existence, all existence, the senses, the, the, all, everything you perceive with the senses. Symbols are psychoactive. Psychoactive means they, they have an influence on your emotions and your thoughts. Um, like drugs have, like alcohol has, like sleeping pills have, like certain activities have, etc. Um, only drugs and alcohol, etc., put in a very crude way, in a very artificial way. Uh, symbols are much finer. They can be just as powerful, but they are much, much, much finer. They influence your emotions. When you hear particular music, it, it, it can make you cry, just like that. Just the sound of one instrument can make, or one, one voice can make you cry. Symbols are used to strengthen your identity. Um, that is your personal identity, how you perceive yourself, but also your um, how you perceive yourself as part of a group. And the obvious example is our clothing. Um, our clothing says something about you and about the group you feel you belong to. Even very, very, very ordinary clothing that you buy everywhere or that has been given to you by, by a friend, it says something about you. And in other words, symbols strengthen your security. <clears throat> your sense of security in, in existence, in this world. Um, now, we, now we're coming in a more interesting area. Symbols can make you feel belong to something that's larger than yourself, if that's what you want. And I want that, I think lots of people want that. An example of that is certain songs, certain poems. <coughs> they, they feel deeper. They feel you're connected with human race or with a particular culture or with a particular uh, sensitivity towards a philosophical sensitivity, let's say. Now, um, the next thing I want to say is quite abstract, so I have to be careful here. Um, I feel very strongly about this, but it, you know, it, it's so different for everybody. Ultimately, symbols symbolize existence, all existence. All symbols, all, all literature, all, every color, for instance, every movement, every scent, every object, every texture, um, they, they remind you of existence. And individually, like I say, every color, so red reminds you of this, but a slightly different red will remind you of something else. But also, as a whole, all symbols um, um, are symbolize all existence. And when you real, realize that, I mean, I, I would have, if I were a student, if I were like in my early 20s, <coughs> my early 20s, I would have found this too abstract. But when you look at it over and over again at the, over the years, you realize that when you look at existence, life, in other words, um, you also see that there's more, even more to life, but it doesn't exist, and yet you perceive it. And so symbols help you to see that. And this is um, not this is not philosophical. This is not abstract. This is the, the essence of beauty, the essence of happiness. Then I mean this is challenging. I know. Um, I mean for some of you maybe. And then finally, I've also written down um, using symbols and especially in creative professions like we do, is a fulfilling activity. We just enjoy it. It's not that. Um, we always realize, we just do it because we, we feel a compulsion, we have to do it. It's such a profound uh, joy. And it doesn't mean that you're not struggling and that you're not frustrated and that you're not looking really seri in, in a very serious manner when you're creating. But deep, deep down inside, we love using, we just adore using symbols in any form, in our music, in our dance, in our, in our animated films and so on. We have we have, a, we have two things. We have a drive to create. It's a natural, it's a human thing. And secondly, um, what you have created, whether it's a beautiful meal or a painting or a film, whatever, you, we have a drive to share that with other people. Because I, I hope you're, you're like me, often you can create just for the, for the sake of creation. But no one will see it, you do it just for the sake of creation. You can dance alone, you can play music alone, just for, as an example. Um, but to share it with other people, when you make a film, and you know that thousands of people will see it, well, that's, frankly, that's really special also. Does this make sense? Yeah? Okay. Now, more, more concretely, I've shown a selection of my short films yesterday, 
and I would like to share with you exactly um, what the genesis was of each film. So for the monk and fish, the technique, by the way, was simply a brush, Indian ink, or what we call sometimes called China ink, but basically it's very strong black ink. Um, on cell, the traditional animation form, and the backgrounds were done in watercolor on watercolor paper. And one of my main inspirations was this. Some of you may know this. It's ancient, I don't know, many, many centuries old. This is a relatively recent version. It's called the Ten Ox Herding Pictures. And it's, when I saw it as a student, I nearly fainted with happiness because I thought it was so amazing. Not so much the pictures, which are great, but the story. It's basically um, a Taoist uh, way of expressing very simply when you have a profound spiritual experience, uh, which, is, which is this, this is the circle, obviously, um, but the path leading to that. And in, amazingly, which really surprised me, what happens after that, as if the, the spiritual awakening, the spiritual realization is not enough, there's, a, there's um, a phase after that, as it were, in time. And it's basically symbolizing a, a man, it looks like a boy, but it's supposed to be an adult man, uh, who has lost his ox, and then finds first the traces, then sees the ox, then tames the ox, then tames it enough to walk side by side, it's the top right. Then is so comfortable with the ox that he is in union with the ox, he can sit on it. And the next stage, as if this is not enough, I would say this is enough. The next stage is that he doesn't need the ox anymore. He, the, the, the state of union is realized, he, the, the ox is not needed. The ox can symbolize the practice of meditation, for instance. <coughs> and if that is not enough, he reaches the next phase of total, pure nothingness. Nothingness in the Buddhist sense or Taoist sense, which is positive. And then there's two phases after. It's, you can find it on the internet. It's well known, um, made by different artists. I saw it as a student, and when I uh, conceived of Monk and the Fish, I thought, I have to, I have to go that way. <coughs> that is what I really want. What because, are these symbols Sorry? What are these this, this series of drawings is uh, well known under the name The Ten, the ten Ox Herding Pictures. You can Google it, you find it immediately. And it comes with the text on each picture. I actually didn't even read the text. Well, I did, but I wasn't really impressed by the text. It was very um, abstract to me. I found the, the pictures already enough. And it's it, it was already uh, well known in the hippie years, and some people have made songs on it. Uh, Cat Stevens had a, uh, an album called Catch the Bull at Five. That means Catch the Bull at the Fifth Picture. Uh, for instance, and um, when I, I, I conceived of the monk and the fish, I was, uh, it was a bit like my last my, my last um, attempt at staying an animator. Um, you, you may not realize it, but many animators are all the time questioning if they should remain animators because it's tough. Um, wherever, um, I mean, uh, independent filmmakers, not if you were employed by by a big studio, um, it's tough because it's so insecure. And your creativity is unstable. It's not just a, a lovely river of creativity. No, it, it runs dry at times. And um, sometimes you have got huge obstacles of, of people not believing in your work, etc., etc. And I was really questioning, should I continue doing commercials, which I've been doing for 10 years. I learned a lot and I had wonderful uh, collaborators, etc. But um, I couldn't get people interested in making my own films. I tried the National Film Board of Canada, I tried BBC, etc. Et and then I uh, came an invitation from a French studio in the southeast of France called Folimage, and they said, send us your storyboard, we will select the best one, and you can be an artist in residence in our studio. You get six months to make your film. It has to be a film, maximum six minutes long. Um, and you can have help from our team and all the material, the camera, etc. It was a, a, a very unusual invitation, and still is unusual. And as journey, yes. Yes, so the question is how many, when did this happen from the beginning of my career? I, um, I started working professionally after my studies, animation studies, in 1980, or 79 actually, 79 in, in Spain. 
and this invitation came in 1992. So I'd been well over 10 years um, doing commercials and often enjoying them because commercials, it's a different kind of uh, creativity, but I still find it, find it very creative and, and I learned a lot, an incredible lot. Um, so uh, I thought, okay, I give it one last trial. Um, I'm going to send a storyboard about a film which really comes from my, my deepest point, if you, if you want to call it like that. And if they select this, it means that I'll be fine. If they don't select this, I ha seriously have to make the decision either to stay commercial for the rest of my life, uh, which was not too attractive, or simply to leave animation and find another. I was even training already to do something else. Um, so they, they select the storyboard and I felt fine because it comes from a very personal point. I feel very, very strongly about it, but it also means it's very vulnerable. If they reject it, you also feel that. Um, so, sorry, that's a long story about the inspiration for the story. My story of the monk and the fish actually ends, let's say, at, at this image, the top right. I didn't represent all the images because I, um, I um, spiritually I didn't feel ready. I, I couldn't talk with authority about the tenth picture um, at, at that time. This was one of my main inspirations uh, stylistically in terms of drawing. When I saw the drawings by Zen Buddhist monks, Zen Buddhist priests from Japan in the 19th, 18th and 17th century and from China, like this one is Japanese, um, the art artist is called Ikaku, Hakuin, Hakuin Ikaku, he's quite well known. Um, they, are, they are priests in a monastery and they, they do ink paintings every day. When I saw this, I, I said to myself, this is me. I remember very well, it was, I was in my mid-twenties and it was so nice because when you draw a lot as a child, you, you search for your identity. You try this, oh, this is great, but is that me? Well, I don't know, but this is great. And you try that, that's great too, and you try something else. So you all the time you kind of explore what is really you, what is your personal purpose. Uh, and when I saw this, uh, I realized I found it. Not that I wanted to imitate this, I can't. This is from the um, Far East. It's not, it's not my culture. It's not my. I haven't used a brush since childhood like they have. But they use space. They use simplicity. They use grace, gracious, uh, gracious of the grace of the line. Um, they use the, the very fine detail and a very loose, rough uh, brush stroke, and with a with. Um, an expertise with a professionalism which was deeply inspiring. So I felt like I found my, my style, but not imitating this, but being inspired by it. Another one, it's very rough, it's childlike, and that's, that's the wonderful paradox. It's spontaneous and childish, and at the same time very mature, at least in my eyes. And it's, it has humor. This artist is called Don Tembo. Don Tembo. Sometimes that's the text on the bottom right of the picture. Just here, it's on the edge of the screen. These are the first drawings I did of the monk. I had a brush pen at that moment. They were new. They, I didn't know they existed. They came on the market. This, I'm talking about uh, early 80s, they came on the market. Um, yeah, the very beginning of the 80s. And my colleagues and I, we all said to each other, have you tried this? It looks amazing. The ink is already in the brush. Oh my god, that's much easier than, than using a normal brush. Um, so I played around with it and I thought, wouldn't it be great to animate this character, to make a film with this? And here are some, when I knew that I was going to um, do the storyboard, here are some storyboard pages of the monkey and fish. I believe, uh, for those of you who are literally in animation, I believe strongly in keeping the storyboard simple and clear. Um, because I've been in selection committees occasionally where I had to select a program, uh, a, a project from a whole pile of storyboards. And when the storyboard is messy and obscure and far too much detail, you, 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 you sigh, you are not happy. It's, it's unpleasant reading and you can't visualize the film. Keep it clear, simple. Yeah, there are lots of details you will tell later, you don't have to tell them yet in the storyboard. Another storyboard page. And these are just 
research drawings, just drawings to explore the, the beauty of the Romanesque architecture, which is very common around the Mediterranean Sea, or all over Europe, but especially in the Mediterranean Sea, which is the arch, the simple arch that's Romanesque. No decorations, that's more, that would be, be more Gothic, but just very simple beauty of, of the repetition of the arch all the time in the architecture. And this is a finished image from the film as you've seen, uh, seen yesterday, if you were there. So this is the bucket of fish. Uh, they, they, um, I'll go back. They uh, selected the storyboard. I, I had six months to make it. I went over time, it took me seven months, but I was in a state of bliss because I love this project so much. And I was also so happy to be uh, independent from producers, in, I'll explain, when you do a commercial, you all the time have to show it to the advertising agency every step, because they control the commercial, they conceive the commercial, they pay for it, often very handsomely, um, you, you're delighted, it's an interesting commercial, but you have to check it all the time, every step, with the advertising agency. Then when you make your own film, okay, it was, the storyboard had to be pre-selected, but once it was selected, I could literally say, in, in a polite way, Leave me alone, trust me, you will see the film when it's finished. Um, which, which was the case here, and of course I asked friends for feedback occasionally. Um, that, that, was, that gave me confidence to continue to be an animator afterwards. Father and daughter. Excuse me. Yeah? Uh, the combination of Romanesque architecture and uh, Eastern calligraphy is, uh, is very peculiar. 